And we're live. Hello and welcome to our virtual Lunch and Learn. Today we're talking about UL508A panel design practices. My name is Rachel Green. I'm the Digital Communications Specialist here at McNaught McKay Electric Company. Presenting for us today is Randy Mueller, Systems Engineer out of our Toledo, Ohio branch. Out in the comments section, ready to answer your questions today are Carol Weber, technical consultant and Eric Dixon, systems engineer. Both of them are joining us from Michigan. We will also have a Q&A portion at the end for Randy to answer your questions in more depth. We'll be getting started shortly, but we'd like to allow a few minutes for attendees to join us. As you come in, let us know where you're tuning in from in the comments section. As we continue to socially distance, we're really happy to bring these to you live on YouTube, making it possible for you to join us from the comfort and safety of your homes and offices. You can view recordings of previous virtual Lunch and Learns on our YouTube channel under the Virtual Lunch and Learn playlist. And we will be continuing this series every Wednesday at noon, so be sure to join us on your lunch break. Welcome, Leanne. Welcome, Paul. For anyone just joining us, welcome to our virtual Lunch and Learn UL508A panel design practices. Let us know where you're joining us from in the comment section. Hi, Joseph. Hi, Justin. We'll be looking for questions as you have them, and our presenter, Randy Mueller, um, will help you avoid some common pitfalls when selecting and installing industrial control components for UL listed panels. Our specialists, Carol Weber and Eric Dixon, will do their best to respond to your questions in the comments as we go along. We'll also have a Q&A segment at the end of Randy's presentation to address some of those questions in more depth and to allow some time for any follow-up questions you might have. If you'd like to reach out afterward or if you have further questions for Randy, you can send us an email at mcmclive at mc-mc.com. Be sure to let us know which session you attended and we'll direct your questions to Randy. We'll have that email address on the screen for you at the end as well. All right, it looks like we have a number of viewers now. Randy, I will pass it over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in today for the next installment in our series of virtual lunch and learns. My name is Randy Mueller. I'm a systems engineer with McNaughton McKay out of the Toledo, Ohio branch. Um, I specialize in Rockwell's industrial controls hardware. So a lot of the components that we discussed today um, fall into my bucket. So the title of today's session is Panel Design Best Practices according to UL 508A. Um, as you can see from my uh, intro slide here, I found the, uh, the best way to go about that is to review some common misapplications or maybe oversights um, with, with UL 508 panel design. So kind of telling you what to do by telling you what not to do, I guess. Um, I found it's a little more engaging that way. Um, and if you kind of follow these, these best practices or avoid these, these pitfalls, um, you're sort of inherently going to be a little more compliant. Um, so really what I'm gonna be doing here is I'm gonna start running through um, I guess not a top 10, but maybe a top 16, 17, or 18 uh, top misapplications. Um, according to UL 508A. So I guess specifically, why are we talking UL 508A? Um, in the United States, if you're looking at industrial panel design, um, you're really looking at maybe three, three main electrical design standards, uh, the, the widest, most um, overarching being NEC, National Electrical Code. Um, and then you've got NFPA 79, which is a good uh, handbook um, electrical standard for industrial machinery. And, and then we get down to what we're talking about, specifically UL 508A, the uh, standard for safety in industrial control panels. When we're talking about these three standards, um, there is a lot of overlap. Um, so they will borrow from each other. Um, 
like I said, that NEC, I guess, is, is because that's the one that um, any electrical installation needs to follow. It's, it's the most broad. Um, so UL 508A, I would say, is the most prescriptive as far as uh, specific requirements, um, how to maybe meet some of the requirements in the other codes, um, a lot more shall and, and shall not. So a lot, of, a lot of the components that you look at are, um, are listed or tested according to UL, um, to UL standards. So I would say that um, even if you are not a panel builder or machine builder that needs to uh, have a UL listed panel, I'd say that it's good to have a, a series of best practices for panel design. And a lot of those can borrow from some of the specific um, requirements found, found in UL 508A. So kind of the scope that we're talking about here, UL 508A, um, general use panels, a thousand volts or less, I believe that's actually increased. Um, it used to be 600 volts, um, but it does again, require compliance to, uh, the NEC installation standards. And we're just going to be talking a lot about, um, power control circuit wiring, uh, a lot of device selection as far as, um, what devices are allowed to be used where in the panel. And then, um, a little bit at the end about maybe some enclosure uh, specifications, um, device mounting, spacing, installation, things like that. So um, before I jump right in, and as you can see, the first uh, the first thing we're going to discuss today being disconnects. Um, I think I think it's important that we review a um, little bit of terminology. So throughout today's presentation, I'm going to be talking about what components are allowed to be used in certain parts of the panel or certain parts of this, um, certain circuits, I guess. And so it's important that we're all on the same page here. Uh, this is probably a review to many, but um, it's important to note the, the differences between a feeder circuit, a branch circuit, and then um, a control circuit within a panel. So looking here at, at, uh, at this diagram, um, starting at the feeder circuit and the definition that I have here is, is all the power conductors and components from the incoming feeder disconnect to the line side of the last branch short circuit protective device. Um, that would be your fuse or uh, circuit breaker. So really here we're talking about your, um, your incoming, let's say 480 volts. Um, it's pretty common here in the United States uh, through the main disconnect and then maybe feeding off to multiple branch circuits. All of this is considered the feeder circuit. Um, and then when we look at branch circuit, that's um, it's easiest to look at it from the load up. So all the wiring components between the last overcurrent protection device and the load. Um, so again, let's start um, looking at let's say the motor load here. All that so that included the conductors, the starter, motor controller, um, and then all the way up to the line side of the branch circuit protection device. Whether that um, looks like probably a circuit breaker in this case is considered the branch circuit. And then you have the control circuit, um, carries the electrical signals, signals directing the performance of um, motor controllers. Um, typically, rule of thumb, I mean, you can say, look at the, uh, look for a control circuit transformer or maybe a three phase power supply. Um, however, that's not always the case. For instance, um, you, it, is, it is load dependent, I guess I'd say. So if we look here, um, there you've got a, a transformer, so um, so you may think, oh, control circuit, but on the secondary side of that, you have a single phase motor, so that is still considered a motor branch circuit. Um, so you do need to be careful to uh, to note the uh, the load that you have, um, and that's important, I guess, for especially if you're looking at maybe short circuit current calculations where uh, control circuits are exempt and uh, power circuits are what you need to account for. Um, I don't have the time today to go into a whole lot of detail on SCCR, but um, it's important to, I guess, note the differences. And then within the uh, control circuits, there are um, varying uh, classes, I guess, class one, class two. Um, class two specifically is what we're gonna go into a little more detail on today, um, energy limiting uh, circuits, and I'll, I'll dig into that a little deeper. So now that we have that reviewed, I'm gonna jump in here for a, uh, the first of our misapplications or um, commonly seen mistakes in a panel. So you look here 
um, you have two very similar devices, or maybe they look very similar. They're both rotary devices, in this case, three pole rotary devices, and really they're doing the same thing as far as disconnecting a three phase load. Um, the difference being the UL rating that each is uh, tested to. The device here on the left is a manual motor controller, maybe uh, better known as a uh, motor isolator or an app motor disconnect. Um, this is the Bulletin 194L in this case pictured here. On the right, we have a uh, 194R rotary disconnect switch. Um, what you'll see often because of the maybe low cost or um, smaller footprint is these devices being used as the main disconnect in a panel um, in the feeder circuit. Um, and that is not allowed per, per UL. So this has a UL 508 rating compared to uh, this device has a UL 98 rating. Um, and those are devices that are allowed to be used in the feeder circuit as a main disconnect. So when you're in the feeder circuit, um, look for a UL 98 rating, or in the case of circuit breakers, a UL 489 rating. To talk a little bit about feeder disconnects, um, there are more requirements than, than just um, listed here, but, but really um, a big one is minimum spacing requirements between conductors. That's something that just isn't met here with a UL 508 device as far as the uh, conductor spacing. Um, there are more requirements as far as being interlocked to the door. Um, so you see here a, uh, a circuit breaker with a flanged operator, a uh, non-fusible visible blade disconnect, also flange operated, and then the rotary style. So these are all, these two to UL98, this to UL489, and are approved for main disconnects. So since we talked a little bit about a rotary disconnect, um, I think it's important to point out that uh, NFPA79 has a specific requirement that comes into play here. So this is something where you see a little bit of overlap between um, some of the standards where NFPA 79 um, is, is the one that really um, requires this, but then UL 508A requires compliance to NFPA 79 in this, in this sense. So when you have a rotary disconnect, right, you've got the disconnect and the rod that then sticks through the handle, or sorry, that sticks through the door of the panel with the handle mounted on the outside. Um, NFPA 79 requires um, that the main disconnect is operable independent of the door position. So that means whether the door is open or closed, you need to be able to turn that switch on and off. Um, and the key, the key uh, wording here is without the use of an accessory tool or device. So something you may see is, is if you don't have an internal handle like this um, and you have the, the door open for troubleshooting purposes, you may see uh, you know, a maintenance guy use maybe a wrench uh, to turn that switch on or off, um, but that leads to, you know, some arc hazard uh, safety issues. So NFPA 79 requires the use of this internal handle. Um, I think also in the requirement, it says it needs to be um, purposeful, I guess, the actuation of it. So, so this style here that you're looking at, um, Rockwell's NFPA 79 handle, it's sort of, uh, if you're familiar with, or if you have toddlers um, that you want to keep from going from uh, room to room, um, you kind of put that that safety handle over the knob that will just sort of spin freely um, until you squeeze the sides or, or however those work. Um, in this case, though, uh, this one, this design is you need to uh, pull out and then and then twist. Um, otherwise, it will just it will just spin freely. So so that's just a uh, an accessory used to meet NFPA 79 requirements. So since we talked about um, this this UL 508. Um, app motor disconnect or, or load switch. Mainly we talked about how it's not allowed to be used in the feeder circuit as a main disconnect. So where is it allowed to be used or where is it designed to be used? Um, I'd say specifically <clears throat> that these are located below the last branch circuit protection device, fuse or circuit breaker. Um, and typically this is um, in between the motor controller and the motor itself. Um, it provides a, a disconnecting means um, at the motor if, let's say, you're out of sight from the uh, the control panel that has the starter in it. It's it's helpful for for installation and troubleshooting. Um, coworker and myself were out at a customer 
um, helping with some some drive installation and uh, the, the the panel that had the drive was on was on a, a floor up and then one floor below was the actual uh, pump motor that this VFD was was uh, controlling and so it's it's nice when you're installing and you're uh, you're making sure right that your potentiometer is uh, correctly going from zero to 60 hertz or, or what have you that you have this at motor disconnect switch uh, open so that you're not actually sending any any current to the motor itself but you can make sure that you've got the drive uh, behaving like you want to so that's really the the intended use of, of these devices so i think it's important to review the uh the difference between branch circuit protection and supplemental protection this comes into play specifically um, with circuit breakers. Um, so if you look at these three devices here, very similar looking devices, uh, all three pull with the uh, front toggle switch. Um, it may look like anyone should be able to, use, to be used in any place in the circuit. And um, that's not the case, however. So if you look on the left here, this device is a, a supplemental protector. And these two devices are, um, well, the one here is a molded case circuit breaker, Bulletin 140G, and here is the 1489M miniature circuit breaker. The difference is that these two devices are tested to UL 489, whereas the supplemental device is tested to UL 1077. So what are the differences in those two standards? UL 489 applies to both the feeder and branch circuits. So these devices are allowed to be used in either the feeder or the branch circuit. Um, when we're talking about circuit breakers, they're providing both the disconnecting means and the uh, circuit protection. You see these applied at no more than 80% of their current ratings. Um, unless some cases they're marked for 100%. And, and really that's to meet, I guess, minimum sizing requirements. So 125% minimum uh, sizing requirements, depending on where you're using those, let's say as in the feeder or branch. And really they're designed to protect the uh, circuit wiring. So compare that to UL 1077. Um, as, as the name says, supplemental protector, it's designed to supplement circuit protection that's already in place. Um, rule of thumb, and uh, I guess, for the most part, these are used in, in control circuits um, to individually protect loads, um, control devices, PLCs. Um, and these can be applied at 100% of the rated current since these are designed primarily to protect the load and there is some sort of branch protection already in place. So one of the big uh, differences between these two that you can see right off the bat is the spacing requirement where UL 489 requires one inch of space through the air, so here in the blue, and two inches of space between conductors over the surface. Whereas UL 1077 is about half that, or a little less, I guess, than through the air, where it's three eighths of an inch through the air and one inch over the surface requirement. So you can see that just at a quick glance by, I guess, what I like to call these um, fins with this UL 489 rated device. So that's how you get that, that two inch. Um, pull the pull device. So if you had, if this was a two or a three pull device, the conductors would be uh, separated by the required spacing. In addition to just the spacing requirements, there are more internal uh, design and construction differences between those, these two devices. The arc chamber is a little more robust than the UL-489 device. There are some different um, material and conductor testings that that are for UL 489 rated devices. So it's a little bit more than just the spacing, but it's important to note those differences where this would be something where I'd say, uh, if you import maybe a European panel, uh, IEC standards aren't quite as stringent when it comes to um, circuit breakers or miniature versus supplemental versus branch. Um, for the most part, uh, the supplemental protectors can be used throughout the circuit and with some of the IEC standards because they can do a little bit more. Um, I guess they're allowed to selectively kind of coordinate a little bit better so they can uh, use these devices and a little more freely 
than uh, than we can here in the United States. So it's something important to look out for. Along the lines of spacing requirements, this is something you could see often is uh, power distribution blocks and uh, the standard that they are tested to compared to the standard that maybe a general use terminal block is tested to. So again, because this is used in the, or I guess the ones we're talking about, the distribution blocks used in the feeder require one inch of spacing through the air and two inches over the surface. Um, that standard for a power distribution block is UL 1953. You look here um, at maybe this general use terminal block. This is tested to uh, UL 1059, which is more of a general use uh, standard or requirement. And it's not always this obvious. So you look here and say, oh, well, of course, this one is designed for the feeder and I would never use this. In the feeder, but there are power distribution blocks that look similar to this on the right, but that still don't meet the UL 1953 standards and are tested to UL 1059 that look pretty similar to this, um, but still cannot be applied in the feeder circuit. So I think it's important to note that. Uh, quick way to look at the side, uh, look at the sticker, look at the, uh, the installation guide. It'll say UL 1953, and it'll actually be a the circled UL listing on it compared to maybe a, a very similar looking block that would say UL 1059. And I believe those are actually UL recognized devices, so more of a general use as opposed to the specific listed 1953 device. So something to look out for there. At the beginning, I touched very briefly on uh, control power. And specifically today, we're gonna to talk about class two power, what it is, when it's required to be used, and I guess how it sort of came about. So in today's control world, uh, we're shifting a lot more towards DC powered uh, controls, specifically 24 volt DC in a lot of the case, when we're talking about some of the sensitive equipment like PLCs and uh, small field devices, sensors, um, as well as critical safety devices. Um, a lot of these devices are tested to NEC class two requirements, which is really a safe low voltage circuit. The primary um, goal of this is to eliminate shock and fire hazard. So what are these requirements? Um, in the simplest terms, you're limiting the maximum power to 100 volt amps. So typically, if we're talking 24 volt DC, that's just a little over four amps on the output of, let's say, a power supply. Um, it's important to note, however, that a just because you have a power supply that's 100 volt amps or less, it doesn't necessarily mean it's it's rated for NEC class two. There's a few more uh, tests required for certification. <laughs> It's also important to note that you can't take a larger power supply and just fuse it down on the output to uh, 100 VA and consider that a class two power source. Okay, so that's what class two is, but when does it need to be used? The easiest answer to that is it needs to be used anytime um, the device's label is UL listed to a class two power supply. So if you look here at this label from a uh, sensor, you see it is UL listed and you see 10 to 30 volts DC class two. So that right there, as soon as you use this uh, or put this on a non class two circuit, it, you, it loses that UL listing. So, so what are we talking about practically almost any uh, DC sensor from any manufacturer is going to carry a class two requirement. Um, I mean, practically, I mean, these sensors are being made smaller and smaller. You're packing a lot into a very uh, small package. And so if you don't limit the power that you're making available, you, you risk arcing, uh, damaging the components in there. So the benefits, like I said, you can get smaller and smaller uh, components. 
you can't the the certification is a little bit quicker if you're able to uh, certify these smaller components to specifying that it's a low low energy class two circuit. Obviously, the risks of not complying would be um, damaging the equipment, using or losing the uh, UL listing. I would say that this might be something that is uh, maybe wasn't as closely uh, checked on by inspectors, specifically because it's a little trickier because there are field devices are are the vast majority or a lot of the devices that require class two are field devices. So if if you've got an inspector checking out a panel, maybe they're not always looking at every field device and sensor being used. Um, but I think this is something that's probably being looked at a little closer today as there are more and more devices that are requiring class two power sources. So how do you implement a class two circuit? Well, the easiest way would be right from the design. Uh, typically you'd have a, a standard 24 volt DC power supply for, for general purpose use, and then a smaller class two rated power supply that's limited to you know that, that four amps max on the output. Um, Ellen Bradley 1606 power supplies have a uh, pretty wide selection of class two rated devices. Okay, but what if after the fact, you don't have a class two power supply in and you add some devices that you find are required class two power source? Well, you can look at adding a, uh, what we call an electronic circuit protector that is rated to class two on the output of a standard power supply. So I said, you can't uh, fuse down the output of a standard, power supply, but you can purchase a class two rated ECP or electronic circuit protector um, and use that for, for your class two loads. So there are two designs currently available from Rockwell, this um, sort of this block design, which is the four outputs. And then this newer, the 1694 electronic circuit protector is a modular design where you can add as many um, as many protection modules as you'd like, I think up to well, obviously we're not talking class two, but up to 40 amps for the just the standard device. So you can have class two outputs um, as many as you need. So like I said, this is added after the power supply where you could you know, power a standard 24 volt DC circuit, then also run into the CCP and then power multiple class two circuits. Next, we're gonna talk about component Rating specifically voltage ratings and slash voltage rated devices. Um, there are many devices that are compact, uh, lower cost, really convenient to use. Um, but one thing to look out for is that they are specifically rated for certain power systems. So, for example, here on the right, we have one of the miniature circuit breakers that I've already talked about. And if you look at the label, it's rated for 480Y slash 277. So what does that mean? It means these devices are only allowed to be used on a solidly grounded Y power system. So that means face to phase is 480, and then face to neutral or ground is a 277. So this is not a, I guess what we'd call a fully rated device, which would be maybe a molded case circuit breaker or fusing, um, which can be applied to um, ungrounded delta, corner grounded delta, high resistance Y. Um, so that's maybe the benefit, right, of these smaller devices. You can uh, lower footprint in the, in the panel, lower cost in some cases, but you need to make sure you're aware of the power system that, you're in, that these are gonna be installed in if it's maybe an older facility with an ungrounded or corner grounded delta, uh, these devices are, are not intended to be used. Really because it's, it's what a single pole is rated to break. And so in this case, a single pole um, is not intended to, to break a, a fault that you could see on a ungrounded or corner grounded delta um, if, the, uh, if the right fault to ground situation occurs. So something to look out for. Little review on a uh, motor overload protection. Um, 
required when the uh, for a continuous duty motor, one horsepower or larger. Um, required that it should trip at no less than 115% of the setting. That 115% should sound familiar because 1.15 is the uh, typical service factor you'll see on a standard induction motor. That's because these are you know, expected to run at about 115% of that full load current for an extended period of time, and you don't want that overload to trip. This isn't something that you really have to be uh, cognizant about too much because um, in this case, we're looking at, let's say, a solid state um, E1 plus overload relay. Um, and most manufacturers really factory calibrate the overload relays to 115 to maybe 120 percent of the dial setting. So really, you just need to worry about setting that dial setting to exactly the FLA of your motor um, and you're good to go. Now, when you have a service factor motor less than 1.15, those need to be taken offline a little quicker. So you just need to check the instructions of the overload relay that you're looking at. In this case, the E1 Plus says anything less than a 1.15 service factor, you set that dial to 90% of the FLA. And then make sure you know, you've got your, your trip contact wired in, in series with your, uh, your motor uh, contact or coil and, and that your uh, start stop circuit is working correctly. But more specifically, um, something that maybe isn't quite as obvious is uh, a VFD or a drive powering multiple motors. Um, as many probably know, the, uh, at least Rockwell's VFDs, most VFDs have integral overload protection, um, but that's intended for a single motor use. So in some instances, it could be beneficial um, cost-wise or just depending on the application to run multiple motors at the same time off of a single drive. Rockwell's motors are rated, or Rockwell's drives are rated for that. Um, a few things you need to look out for though. The overload protection is not rated for multiple motors. So it is required that you have a individual overload for each motor. Um, so really you're just going to turn up the overload on the drive to the max and then have individual protection for each motor. I think it's also important to note that uh, the vast majority, or I'd say many uh, solid state overload relays aren't rated to be used on the output of a drive. Uh, this is because for the most part, they're tested at 50 or 60 Hertz. And so the varying frequency on the output of a drive will uh, mess with some of the internal uh, thermal simulations, I guess that it's, that it's running. And so it won't be able to accurately detect the uh, the current of the motor. So I'd say rule of thumb, it's safe to stick with a bimetallic or maybe eutectic overload for each motor. Or check, just check the ratings of the overload that you're looking at. Uh, here at the end, I've got sort of a grab bag of, of more misapplications um, on each slide here. So, so looking at this one, we're looking at an instantaneous trip circuit breaker. Uh, you may know it as a magnetic only circuit protector or a motor circuit protector. Um, the way this differs from maybe your typical molded case circuit breaker is that this has only the magnetic only circuit protection or trip unit, where a, a molded case breaker has magnetic protection for the uh, high overcurrent short circuits and then as well as thermal protection for the uh, lower level overcurrents over an extended period of time. Where you'll see these is in um, manufacturer tested combinations. So maybe a combination starter here, um, where UL specifically approves the combination use. And so the manufacturer is allowed to use this in, at the same time as uh, this specific motor starter. This isn't something where you would um, put together your own um, I guess your own starter and use the, the MCP. This is where you would stick with, you know, either moldy case breaker or a different type of thermomagnetic circuit breaker. Um, and so this is something where you just need to make sure that these devices are typically designed to be used either as factory assembled and approved combinations or, you know, by a UL approved builder. So 
Next on uh, power supplies. So a industrial power supply or one that is UL listed to UL 508 um, can be used to 100% of its rating. That's not to say that a general purpose power supply can't be used in the panel. Um, if it is not UL listed to 508A, however, or to UL 508, um, that power supply can only be used to 50% of its amp rating. So you could be looking to save a little bit of money with a you know, a general purpose power supply, but just keep in mind that you're also limiting the, uh, the applied rating that you're allowed to use that at. Kind of along those lines are other certification or other uh, or devices that are approved um, to other standards. You need to be careful that, you know, you're using a device that is tested to UL and you know, maybe not CE, CCC, even CUL, even uh, <laughs> even in Canada, um, United States and Canada's UL don't always uh, line up and and play together perfectly. It might be surprising, but um, some devices you may find have a carry a CUL listing and not a a UL listing. So, just something to look out for, um, and just make sure you're you're really checking the uh, intended application of the component as well as the, uh, the standard that it's tested to. Another common oversight or something that a UL inspector will see is incorrect or maybe missing uh, markings. So for example, um, a panel builder isn't required to have the main disconnect um, inside the panel. Sometimes they are need to be noted specifically on the schematic, um, the type of disconnect, you know, the rating, and, um, you know, where it is to be applied outside the panel once, it, uh, once it's on site. So that just needs to be uh, clearly marked in the schematic, so here. If you look at other, other field devices need to be listed, so you need to, you know, mark what size motor panel is designed to be controlling, as well as maybe a, uh, a field switch. Some other common um, marking issues would be leaving out the uh, panel short circuit current rating from the nameplate, maybe some, some missing field termination uh, markings, or an incorrectly marked uh, enclosure. When it comes to um, general installation practices, um, maybe like tolerance uh, clearance. UL really uh, defers to the manufacturer's recommendations or I guess requirements. So looking here at some PowerFlex 525 drives, um, UL isn't going to, to list mounting requirements for every manufacturer's drives. They defer to um, right to the user manual or installation guide for the specific drives that you're looking at. So in this case, we're looking at two inches of clearance above and below. Um, and so that's where that's where the inspector will will go to to make sure that you're meeting those uh, installation requirements. Another big one would be uh, the routing of cables. Um, good rule of thumb is just keep your your <laughs> your power, your control, and your um, communication cables segregated. Um, so the UL 508 requires that um, conductors that are routed in the same wireway need to be at the highest rated voltage. So I guess one big no-no would be um, your power wiring running alongside maybe that common like 300 volt ethernet cable that you see. Um, so not only are you going to have major communication and network issues, um, but it is against code since that the uh, the 300 volt Ethernet cable, the insulation voltage rating is not um, meeting the rating of the other wires that it's routed with. So you can get creative as far as you know minimum spacing requirements, uh, barriers, or separate wireways, but just something to look out for, and that is something that an inspector is going to look at. 
along the lines of cabling would be um, just you all listed wire. If it's not on the wire, the uh, inspector is going to want to see it on the cable spool itself that it came from. Um, to go one step further, if let's say you're using some crimp on ring lugs, in this case, I've got a picture here of some uh, Thomas and Betts ring lugs. Um, you can see here they carry a UL listing. That's fine and good. Um, but if you take it one step further, it will actually specify the uh, tool, the crimp tool part number that these are to be installed with. So that <laughs> it may sound very, very nitpicky, but an inspector could ask to see the crimp tool that you use to install <laughs> the ring lugs onto the wire. Um, and if it's not the specified tool, um, you may lose that UL listing. As far as NEMA enclosures um, and UL listed type enclosures, um, just because you have a, a NEMA enclosure rating doesn't mean that it's a UL listed uh, device. You do need to make sure that that the enclosure is is both UL listed and ha and then has the uh, the type rating that you're looking for. So, because really, I mean, NEMA is writing um, the construction specs that a manufacturer builds to. However, the UL requires some specific construction as well as some more uh, testing to receive that UL listed um, enclosure on a panel. So you need to make sure that you have you have both of those. And then along the lines of the enclosure, um, you could have a your perfect you know NEMA type 12 panel. As soon as you cut a hole in it, um, it drops right down to a type one. So it's really you making sure you have the right accessories that are that carry the correct UL listing, as well as um, are rated for the NEMA type that you that you need to meet. So we're talking about you know hubs, um, fans, filters, cutouts, um, bulkheads, anything like that. You need to make sure they are listed accessories that uh, meet the NEMA rating requirements for that panel. And I think I think that's all I had. I uh, hope I didn't fly through those and it was uh, somewhat helpful. Um, I guess I will turn it over to Rachel to see if there was any uh, any questions. Yeah, thank you, Randy. We don't have any live questions at this second, but we're going to give it just a few minutes and see if anyone has any questions now that we're in our Q&A portion. I um, want to thank you for that presentation. That was really great. And for anyone that is watching this as a recording, or if you get your question in just at the last minute, we don't catch it today, be sure to send it to that email address you see on your screen, our MCNC live at mc-nc.com. And uh, make sure to let us know which session you watched and what your, your question is related to, and we'll pass it along to our presenter today, Randy. And we'll wait just another second here and see if anyone has any questions. While we wait, um, I'd like to reiterate, you can reach out to us on the email address here. And um, I'd like to thank you, Randy, again for your presentation and thank Carol and Eric for being our resource out in the comment section today. All right. Thank you to all of our viewers for watching this live stream with us today. We hope the session was informative and engaging for you. Remember to subscribe to our, our McNaughton McKay YouTube channel for more industry content like this. And we look forward to seeing you live again soon. Thank you and have a great day, everyone.